Welcome. How great to see so many of you here. You know, two of my favorite things in the world are reading a good book and walking in the woods. So I really feel like I'm with my people tonight. Uh, it's really, really fun to have you all here. Um, so as I know you all remember, uh, last summer, smoke from the forest fires in Siberia, Canada, and across the West descended upon Whatcom County blanketing us in a scary and oppressive haze. Across the United States, about 8.6 million acres burned in almost 56,000 wildfires. Uh, what a time to be reading <laughs> The Big Burn, Teddy Roosevelt and the Fire That Saved America by Timothy Egan. Um, sadly, wildfires are happening with increasing regularity and intensity across the country. Their names linger in our memory now, the campfire, the Tubbs Fire, the Woolsey Fire, and the first giant fire to sear itself into American consciousness, the Big Burn of 1910. No living person had ever seen a fire with, with such ferocity, speed, and destructive power as the Big Burn. Timothy Egan narrates the struggles of the overmatched rangers against the relentless fire with unstoppable, dramatic force. Equally dramatic and fascinating, is the larger story he tells of Teddy Roosevelt and his chief forester, Gifford Pinchot. Pioneering the notion of conservation, Roosevelt and Pinchot did nothing less than create the idea of public land as our national treasure, owned by and preserved for everyone. But Tim does more than just look back at what was. He challenges us to think about the ways history continues to play out today. This past November, he wrote a piece for the New York Times called the beginning of the end of America's best idea. In it, he shares that the story told by the recent wildfires is grim, portent of nature, altered and convulsive. When considering books for this year's Whatcom Reads program, the committee quickly connected the dots from the recent fire events to Tim Egan's historical recount recounting of the massive wildfire that raged across northern Idaho and western Montana. We were thrilled when this award-winning author and columnist agreed to participate in Whatcom Reads this year. And we will hear from Mr. Egan himself in a few moments. But first, a few logistics and a whole lot of gratitude. Uh, Whatcom Reads is a partnership between Village Books and all of the public and academic libraries in Bellingham and Whatcom County. And one important way that Village Books supports Whatcom Reads is by donating, donating a portion of the proceeds from the sale of the Whatcom Reads books. So be sure to stop by their table tonight. They will be out there. We are also extremely grateful for the generous funding provided by both the Friends of the Bellingham Public Library and the Whatcom County Library Foundation that makes this program possible. Let's give them a round of applause. We also want to thank the City of Bellingham and the Mount Baker Theater for letting us use this beautiful venue so that all of us can be here free of charge. All right, one more good thank you to go. So I'm going to read a list of other supporters of Whatcom Reads, and when I'm done with the list, let's give them one big round of applause uh, all at once. So we want to thank BTV, the city's television station, for filming tonight's event, uh, Allied Arts of Whatcom County, the Fairhaven Village Inn, Chuck Chuckanut Writers Conference, Bellingham Cocktail Week and Ishka Irish Pub, and the Bellingham Herald. All right, Timothy Egan is the best-selling and award-winning author of eight books. A lifelong journalist, he also writes an opinion column for the New York Times. He's a third-generation Westerner who lives in Seattle, a graduate of the University of Washington, the father of two, and he also happens to be a great writer and storyteller. So please help me welcome Timothy Egan. Thank you. Nothing going on tonight? I can't. Hello, Bellingham. This is wonderful. I mean, I'm a writer, not a musician. <laughs> the, 
you know, writing is a fairly solitary pursuit. You sit around in your jammies um, putting words to a screen and wondering if anyone's going to ever connect on the other end. And here we are with the other end. <laughs> My God. Um, that's why I love these one reads, these one books, because um, we're all talking about the ideas from long past and these voices from long past where we're making these people on this page immortal. So thank you, Bellingham, for this wonderful turnout. Thank you also, Rachel, for this great introduction. And thank you, Whatcom County Libraries. Now, um, before I get into my remarks tonight, I want to mention this. That is a Pulaski, ladies and gentlemen. The most used tool worldwide in wildland firefighting. The Forest Service alone keeps 10,000 of them on hand. Um, named for Ed Pulaski, one of the heroes of our story tonight. You're going to hear about him. He's somewhat of a tragic figure. He never got the patent on the Pulaski. Now, um, Rachel mentioned these awards and background that I have, and I, you know, I'm really not a historian. I'm more of a storyteller. Um, that's what I like to do is tell stories. And I'm, if I'm a historian at all, I'm an accidental historian. I stumble upon these things and then I am, end up going down these little warrens and following these trails and looking for people. So I'm going to talk to you about, um, you know, I really do like to time travel. And we're going to time travel tonight. I'm going to talk to you about one of these journeys and why this journey from 1910 matters today. But before I do that, I want to talk, just give you a little bit of background about myself and my sort of professional journey that helped me to get here tonight. I am a native of the Pacific Northwest, third generation. Uh, I came from a family of nine. We were, uh, you know, we grew up in this Irish-American storytelling tradition, which is, you know, you have to compete to tell your stories. But um, also, we believe that the best stories whether they're true or not, belong to those who can tell them. So you really developed a sort of craft of trying to get your, get your story out. I've wanted to be a writer probably since third grade when I was a little kid with uh, missing two front teeth and um, really a little kid. I mean, I, my growth spurt came like when I was 37. Um, <laughs> so, and the nun calls me up to read my poem, this little kid, the you know, missing teeth and the oversized sweater. And, um, Tim, what is your poem? And I go up there, and I, I'm not as tall as the Pulaski. And I read this poem uh, that I wrote about spring. And I'd grown up in, I was born in Seattle, I grew up in Spokane, and we had these long winters. And I remember seeing this little pine sapling poking through the snow. So I wrote this story about the little pine sapling and spring. And afterward, like, all these girls came up to me. And, you know... <laughs> I got this huge reaction, and I was like, wow, maybe this writing is something I can do with, <laughs> do with this thing. That was sort of my start. Now, a lot of writers are hung up on originality. That's one of the first things people face is, God, what can I say that's new and different that hasn't been said? And early on, someone directed me to a quote from the wonderful Willa Cather, who said, there are only two or three human stories and they go on repeating themselves as fiercely as if they never happened. Like the larks in this country that have been singing the same five notes over and over for thousands of years. And then she identified the three stories that go on repeating themselves as the first one is person goes on a journey. You know, that would be the Odyssey, that would be the Hobbit, that would be Huck Finn. Stranger comes to town. Well, we all know the stories of stranger comes to town and falls in love with someone or upsets the local balance or has a secret. And then finally, overcoming the monster. And um, in the Big Burn, we actually have all three of these story elements, which is one of the reasons why I was so attracted to it. Um, I, I hear some people say sometimes in this debate we have um, in educating our children that history doesn't really matter. That, you know, in this era of STEM, we need to teach our kids to be proficient, but why do they need to know their story? Why do they need to know the national story? And I, I'm a great believer, because I was lucky to, as I said, to be raised by a storytelling family, that there's no such thing as boring history. There's only boringly told history. And unfortunately, a lot of that's, that's what our kids get. 
Um, I've heard people also say, what's the bottom line of teaching history? Why should, why should we do this? What's the, what's the commodifying effect of it? Well, what is it worth? What is history worth at a time when everything does have a commodity? When, to quote Oscar Wilde, we have a president who knows the price of everything and the value of nothing. What is the price, you know? Well, don't take my word for it. The Suedians had a saying, a people without history are like wind on the buffalo grass. So thank you again, Bellingham and Whatcom County, for bringing me here to tell you this, this history. Now, um, I started out with writing this book called The Good Rain, and it was because I was curious about my place. I grew up hearing about you know, great men who built railroads and um, carved all the hills of Seattle and dammed the Columbia River and kicked all the Indians off the land, and that was basically the story. Um, and I started looking around, and I thought, you know, this story really hasn't been told. I love this Wendell Berry line, the poet and essayist, essayist who says, you can't know who you are if you don't know where you are. So I, I really tried to find, find the where of what we are. And I, I wrote this book from the point of view of the land, of the glaciers, the forests, the volcanoes, not necessarily the people who tried to knock down that land, although that certainly was a big part of it, but the point of view of the land. Now, it's helped me, as I'm sure it's helped any writers in this room or any artists in this room, and I know there are a lot of them because I, I was lucky enough to see the gallery show inspired by the Big Burn, and thank you. It was just wonderful to see those sparks, to use an unfortunate word, um, go off and start other things. But as a writer, I, I would really have trouble writing in a place if the climate didn't suck. So it, it, it really helps to go. I, I'm my most creative, my most productive on these dark winter months. When it starts to get long light, I'm outside and I'm not very productive. So this really helps me. Um, I did this book on the Dust Bowl called The Worst Hard Time that was for me accidental as well. I was um, going around the Southern Plains for the New York Times writing a series on the collapse of small town America. I went from town to town and heard the same sad story by the same octogenarians and nanogenarians who were the last people to hold on in these tiny little towns. The bank had left, the school had closed, there wasn't a restaurant, there were just a handful of folks living on Social Security. They would disappear themselves soon. And I would close my notebook for this series because it was, you know, the themes were repeating themselves. And inevitably some wonderful person would say, but that's not the story of this place. I say, what is the story? And they'd say, the story is what happened when the land turned on the people the Dust Bowl, the biggest environmental catastrophe in our history, climate change in the 1930s when they changed a huge part of the climate. And so then I started, I had an urgency to this thing because these people were disappearing quickly. And in fact, all my characters from that book have since died, but I could at least get that story. Someone could hand me a baton, look me in the eyes, even though they were 92 years old and say, let me tell you what it was like to be 17 years old and looking out at a wall of dust a mile high and 100 miles wide. So that story, I just felt so lucky to have those wonderful people and to tell that thing and be, be able to chance to live with them. Ken Burns uh, made a wonderful film about that based on my book. I worked with him for several months. and. Uh, if you haven't seen it, it's a two-part series. And Ken and I both arrived at the same conclusion. We, those people, the million people who left, left the Dust Bowl, they were the first climate refugees. They were the people we're going to see in years coming in North Africa and elsewhere as people are being dislocated because of climate. But I was happy to see that come about. Now, with the Big Burn, is another story about my favorite topic, which is the power of nature and our relationship with nature and how we interact with nature and how much, you know, how humble to be in the face of nature and also about unintended consequences. And I'll get to that in a few minutes. I wrote The Big Burn because, I, like I said, I grew up in eastern Washington and our big family would go camping in Idaho and Montana under these, you know, this canvas tent. My dad would be smoking in the tent, you know, and <laughs> drinking rot-cut whiskey. My mom would be, oh, look at the trees. And uh, 
And, um, you know, they, lucky us, the canvas tent never caught fire. But most of the woods were often on fire. And I would see these yellow-shirted warriors, men and women, going off to war to fight wildfire. So very early on, um, smoke jumpers were my heroes. I mean, sure, I like you know, sports players as much as anyone else, but these people who would put on 90 pounds worth of gear, get on a rickety prop plane in Missoula, then go drop themselves into a vertical slope of 70 degrees that was aflame with all this gear, smoke jumpers, they were just heroic. And then as I got to know some of them, I found out that you know, many of them were pursuing master's degrees in English literature, um, which made me like them even more. And so those, those folks were my heroes. Now, the Big Burn had this sort of mythic aura about it in northern Idaho and western Montana and parts of eastern Washington and parts of British Columbia as well. You can occasionally still today see these charred flanks, the ghosts that are left from this big fire. And we would stumble upon them in the woods around the St. Joe River where we went to fish and places like that. And people would talk about the big burn. It was just this sort of little thing from the past that was so fascinating. And so when I came of age and started covering wildfires for the New York Times as part of my portfolio, I decided to go back and take a look at this thing from the perspective of an adult and someone who was trying to understand wildfire. And a couple of things quickly struck me. I'll get to the fire in a second. But we had never in our history tried to or have an organized fight against a wildfire before. That was the first time in 1910 we just said, we're going to try to go against this thing and put it out. It was the first time there was a global focus on a wildfire. The press came from everywhere to cover this thing. So I was going to write this book about the sort of wow effects of a monster. I mean, I was anthropomorphizing it as a bad thing. And I was going to write the story about you know, its own temperatures and how it creates its own uh, weather and just the ferocity and power of something that they had the hubris to think they could knock down. But then as I went into this thing, I got distracted by the backstory. And this happens to me a lot. I sort of worked my way up the character food chain. I started with some wonderful people, a woman named Pinky Adair, who was a doctor's daughter and became a homesteader in Idaho, right next to the National Forest. And in the end was the person who outlived this thing more than anyone else and left a wonderful oral history about what it was like. I got fascinated by the guy that invented this tool um, for his heroics, for his selflessness, and for how much he got screwed in the end and how bitter of a man he was. I got fascinated by these immigrants, these people that came from all over. I even went to Italy to this little village that had sent six people here to fight the fire. Well, they'd immigrated and they, they took firefighting because they paid them 25 cents a day and then ended up dying in the big burn. And then as I moved my way up the character chain, there's the Colossus of Teddy Roosevelt. There's the Colossus of Gifford Pinchot. But I didn't see them, I didn't see Roosevelt as a guy with a chiseled chin in Mount Rushmore. I didn't see Pinchot, who I knew almost nothing about, as a person after whom a national forest is named in southern Washington. I started to see these extraordinary characters. So just to give you an example on Roosevelt, I went to the Library of Congress and read as many of his letters as I could. He was a prolific writer. He wrote 20 books before he was president. Now, he was our youngest president. I'm sorry to take a cheap shot. The current president hasn't read 20 books, you know. <laughs> and, I, I said, and, and, and TR wrote 20 books before he entered the White House. He was going to be an ornithologist. He loved science. He was kind of a nebbishy, nerdy guy. He just loved nothing more than being out in nature and looking at a bird's nest or finding a bunch of bugs that were interacting with each other. It's the kind of person he was. But one letter, and this is what accidental historians like myself look for, really struck me. And that was Valentine's Day. Those of you who've read this book know this story, so bear with me. February 14th, 1884, Teddy Roosevelt on that day lost the love of his life. The wife he was, he, the woman he'd met in college, married. They had just had their first child, 
at home on West 57th Street in New York, and the love of his life died in childbirth. He's heartbroken, but he goes upstairs on the second floor of this townhouse where they lived on West 57th Street, and his widowed mother, who'd been ill, died the same day. So he loses his wife, and he loses his mother on the same day. And he writes on February 14th, 1884, I'll never forget it, I held it with my gloved hands in the Library of Congress, a giant X on the page. And beneath that X, he says, the light has gone out of my life. So he folds up his affairs, he arranges for his sister to raise the young daughter, he retires, resigns his position in the New York legislature where he was sure to be the next governor. He'd already had a prolific career in New York City politics. He was only in his young 30s and goes out west and spends about two years and the west heals him. The land makes him whole. He lives alone in this tiny cabin, but he has his books and he has long walks, long rides. Something happens to him though. Also, the west doesn't just heal young Teddy Roosevelt, but um, he has an epiphany. He looks at this land that the whites have only taken barely a hundred years from, the, I guess if you date it from the founding of the Republic to the time he's out there, just after 1884, and almost all of this great Eden is gone. The things he'd grown up rhapsodizing about, a hundred million bison, they're down to 50 bison that they're gonna hold together in Yellowstone National Park. Birds that used to blot the sky during the, in the migratory flyway, gone. All, forests being stripped right and left, rivers being dammed. He sees ahead of his time. He sees that in a short amount of time, man himself will destroy this place that they've so quickly taken from the 20 million Native Americans who are estimated to have lived here at the time of first contact. Now, fast forward the story. Uh, he does go back to New York. He gets involved again in the state, he becomes governor, and um, he's a reformist. They hate him. He says, um, not all of the people in the New York Assembly were corrupt, but 98% of them were. <laughs> and little has changed since then, I should say, too. Uh, so they thought to get rid of Roosevelt, who was a Republican, uh, they would put him on the 1900 ticket with uh, McKinley. Because vice president, it was famously said, ain't worth a bucket of warm piss. It's what I forget who said that, but LBJ is the one who used to repeat it all the time. <laughs> and um, so they put TR on the ticket. Now, McKinley's president, just a few months into his presidency, McKinley is shot in Buffalo. He doesn't die, but he's shot. Roosevelt is then hiking in the Adirondacks, trying to climb the highest peak in New York, which I guess is a little bigger than one of the things outside of Chuckanut Drive, but <laughs> I had to get that in. Uh, but they would call it a mountain. And um, Secret Service goes up, gets him, Mr. Vice President, McKinley's been shot, come down, Roosevelt comes down, waits a couple days, McKinley doesn't die, so he goes back up there and says, hey, I'm gonna finish the climb. Spends another four or five days. Finally, after about 10 days, they come and get him. Well, McKinley's died. So Roosevelt is sworn in. He's our youngest president. And uh, this is the thing that wasn't supposed to happen. So he goes to the White House with all these reformist ideas and all these ideas about the land. This is an end, one of these accidents of history that I'm so fascinated by. And he brings in another very unusual man who's shaped our history, who's shaped so much of the land that is just outside of this city, a very gawky, geeky, wealthy man named Gifford Pinchot. Now, Pinchot had made his fortune, his family had made their fortune, trying to clear-cut the state of Pennsylvania. And then as these American things, fortunes often happen, he then founded the Yale School of Forestry, uh, designed to keep other people from doing what his family had done. So Roosevelt brings Pincho in, and um, they start this, you know, radical idea, start to promote this really radical idea twofold. One is that land was part of the democracy, the same, you're born an American citizen, and on that birth certificate, you hold title to public land. 
which was a really big deal and a real expansion of our democracy. The other thing was that nature itself had standing. They created national wildlife refuges in addition to national forests and national parks. But the wildlife refuges were really interesting because they said that nature itself had standing. Now, um, he says that conservation was developed, Pinchot did, during these long walks they would take in Rock Creek Park. And uh, excuse me, I'm going to tell one more Trump joke and then I'll end for the night. But <laughs> Uh, often at the end of these walks, they would walk 10, 12 miles, Pinchot and Roosevelt. And Pinchot was about 6'4", and Roosevelt was about 5'8 and a half. And they would do this, you know, after themselves, you know, having a fairly exhaustive day. And they sort of go back and forth and where they're developing this, as they told the story later, the idea of conservation. Now, other people had contributed, John Muir and other writers, but they, they brought it to the bully pulpit. At the end of these walks, they would strip their clothes up naked and go skinny dipping in the Potomac. And um, I, when I was writing and thinking about this later, after you know the book came out and people have commented on this episode of them skinny dipping, I, I tried to put the president, pres I was trying to think of Trump swimming naked in the <laughs> Potomac. And, and then I thought, no, don't think of that image. It's really, <laughs> uh, uh, it's like, you know, Trump golfing without a coat, you just go, God. Um, that's a, that's a, what do they call it, a, um, a species that doesn't belong there. So, um, so now to the fire itself. So they, they developed this idea of conservation. At, at, it has an actual effect because they will set aside an area almost the size of France that's public land. That's all of ours. Now, they're not taking this from private landowners. They're taking it out of what's left over from the land we took from the Indians and from the Louisiana Purchase and other things. But people wanted to pillage and plunder it. People were pillaging and plundering it. People were taking uh, trees, timber, minerals, everything, putting roads in there, putting cities in there, doing whatever they wanted to it. And their idea was, well, can we think about 100 years from now? Can we think about 200 years from now? Think of the people ahead of us. Now, again, to the, to the fire. So last year, so I'm a Seattleite. Like everyone, Pacific Northwesterner, I live and love our summers. As you know, almost all of August was ruined by the smoke. We had worse air than Beijing. And there were many days where you could not go outside, and you couldn't escape it. Eastern Washington, Western Washington, San Juan Islands. No matter where you went, it was everywhere. It made it, me realize and I don't need reinforcement on this, how small this planet is. But, you know, you can blame Canada, those damn Canadians, and uh, they just can't keep their smoke on the other side of the border. We need to build a wall with fans. <laughs> Send them north, right. So um, that made, I'm sure, many of you think about a wildfire. If you didn't think about it, it wasn't an abstract thing. It was in your face. Summer ends, we finally get our air back. California blows up last year. The worst wildfire season in a century. Uh, I went down there and, and went and walked the Santa Monica National Recreation Area, which is 100,000 acres of public land. Beautiful, sitting on this, the Santa Monica Mountains, above the 20 million people in the LA basin. It's basically the, the only wild land outlet that's close to, it's called the largest urban national park because it's so close to so many people. Gone. Just not a stick standing. I couldn't, it was just tragic. I just nearly brought to tears walking this blackened hard earth and seeing a handful of just completely charred trees standing in the Santa, what had been the Santa Monica National Recreation Area. The biggest wildfire in California last year was the Mendocino Fire. It burned almost a half a million acres, which was epic. Now remember that, half a million acres. Now consider the big burn. Three million acres in a weekend. 36 hours. We had never, an area the size of Connecticut burns in a weekend. A hundred people die, five towns disappear from the map. Nobody had ever seen anything like it before. They'd never seen anything like the the hurricane force winds that came through and started that thing. They'd never seen anything like the blowdown, which to me, I covered the Mount St. Helens eruption, reminded me of, of St. Helens, 
seeing so many trees just knocked down like matchsticks. It wasn't the fire that cleared that forest so much. It was the force of the wind and the, the storm itself feeding on it. Now, as this thing was building, it started as a bunch of fires in August. Very, very dry year like last year. They didn't have any rain after a long and very wet winter. And then just a switch went off in April or May. And there was no rain through this entire spring and summer. So these fires were burning. And, you know, fire was the one thing left in the newly settled American West that they were still afraid of. They'd gotten rid of all the wolves. They'd gotten rid of almost all the grizzly bears. They'd moved all the native people off to places where they were out of sight and out of mind. What they were still afraid of was fire. So Seattle burned. Spokane burned. San Francisco burned. Denver burned. All these towns were made of wood. And they were afraid that these little fires were building. This thing in Idaho and Montana would eventually spread all over the West. So they tried for the first time to fight a wildfire. And they organized this army from all over the United States. It happened to coincide with a peak period of immigration in our history. So most of the people they organized to fight this fire were from Italy, which this is the peak of Italian immigration. Remember, Irish immigration started with the famine in the 1840s, but Italian immigration was 50, 60 years later, mostly southern Italian. Serbians, they had, this is one of the fascinating side notes, African-American soldiers from um, this, they were called Buffalo Soldiers. And they were basically this brigade designed to do the dirty work, work that no one else would do. They, they were strike breakers. Sometimes they would go into a town that the Buffalo Soldiers would break a strike. This is the first time they decided they were gonna fight a fire. And when they show up in this little town in the Silver Valley, not far from Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, they instantly doubled the African-American population in the state of Idaho. And um, a lot of people were like, what are these black soldiers doing in our midst? I mean, what, what could they possibly know about fighting wildfire? There were a lot of racist things said in the local papers about this encampment of Buffalo soldiers. So writing in the magazine Colliers, which was a very popular magazine of the day, a writer said this of the army that had been assembled to fight this fire. There are Scotsmen and Negroes, Italians and Danes, Mix, Max, and Scandahoovians. And as I was reading that, it struck me that these are all the people who make America great. So here we are, and they're going to fight this wildfire. Now, there's a class thing going on, too, because back to Gifford Pinchot for a minute. He founds this Yale School of Forestry. Also, he founds the United States Forest Service. Now, we had a forest service. Excuse me. We had national forests, a handful of them but no Forest Service. And that's the way most senators and members of Congress liked it, because no one would take care of this land. There were no stewards. So people could do what they wanted to, and they did. But out of Yale come Gifford Pinchos. They call them little GPs, little Gifford Pinchos. And they were like on this crusade for conservation. They were just evangelical, thinking they were going to save the earth. They were going to go out and be stewards of this new national forest system. They collide with the people who are on the ground and also with this, these bunch of firefighters. Now, one more thing about um, Pinchot before I get to this fire stuff. I'm actually going to tell you one more thing about TR, too, because he's so fascinating. I told you how the West had saved him. He was also famous because after this fire in 1912, uh, when he was running for president under the Bull Moose platform, the independent ticket, he was giving a speech in the Midwest, and an assassin came up within five feet of him and shot him. And he had a book, not the Big Burn, of course, um, <laughs> in his pocket, and that kept him alive. That's the reason he lived. The bullet penetrated and went under his skin. But here's the amazing thing. He talked for 20 more minutes. He finished the speech, and then they took him to the hospital. He said, oh, my God, it's like blood is everywhere. This pulled his chest open to get, they never got the bullet out. The bullet stayed in his body for the rest of his life. And in fact, late in his, present, late in his life, late for him, because he died just before the age of 60, he went down the Amazon. Um, there's a great book about it called The River of Doubt. And he said, it was The River of Doubt. He said, I had to go. It was my last chance to be a boy. So um, Roosevelt had left office 
by the time the big burn is happening in 1908. Pincho is still running the Forest Service. He's not getting along with President Taft. And Pincho was a very odd duck, as I said. He, um, he grew up in a castle called Gray Towers, now run by the National Park Service, had 63 turrets and 27 fireplaces. And like Teddy Roosevelt, Pincho had lost the love of his life at a very young age. He was madly in love with this woman when she was in her 20s and he was in his 30s. And she died, and instead of letting her go, he summoned the spirit. Now, there were a lot of psychics then. It was sort of the rage, but Pincho went well beyond it. He had a relationship with the spirit for about 15 years and wrote about it in his diary in code form. And this was only figured out about 10 years ago when some scholar figured out the code. But it was like that character Harvey from that Jimmy Stewart movie. We had a great time tonight at the president's. You know, we sat, he would come back and talk about the wonderful dinner party that he and the love of his life, he would set a place on the train next to him. No, that seat's taken. And it was for his spirit. Now, um, lucky for us, uh, Gifford Pinchel's grandson lives here in the Pacific Northwest. He started something called, I think, the Bainbridge Institute, and he lives in Seattle. And uh, not long after my book came out, someone said, Would you like to re meet? Um, Gifford Pinchot III. And you know, I was a little nervous because, you know, I, I showed Pinchot and all his odd quirks. So I meet Gimp, Gif Pinchot III. And he looks a lot like Grandpa. Shake his hand, and I'm kind of a little nervous. And I said, well, you know, how did you feel about the way uh, I portrayed your grandfather? And he said, well, he stroked his beard. He had a beard. He said, um, you made him out to be only slightly more daft than family lore had it. <laughs> so I was like, whew, you know, okay, I'm going to live. This is going to be okay. This is going to be a decent evening, yeah. So Pincho was in charge of the Forest Service at the time of this fire. They're chipping away at it. They had, the Roosevelt's gone. They don't want these rangers. They want to kill the Forest Service five years into its thing. They're zeroing out its budget. The senators of the West don't want it. And it's up to Pincho to try to save it. So this thing was hanging by a thread, this great concept of the Forest Service of stewards of the land, hanging by a thread on the eve of this wildfire. Now, one more story about this. He sent out these Yaleys to be forest rangers, and they were the little GPs. So there's a great story, I came upon it in my research, of... Uh, Two gentlemen who, you know, land in Missoula and then go up to Lolo National Forest, and they're just shocked because they see these saloons and these really, you know, quickly thrown together houses of prostitution. Um, and they're just appalled. I mean, this is this is really the Great Crusade meets Deadwood. And, you know, these people are doing what they and so they they send a note back to Missoula saying, um, this is the direct quote. Two undesirable prostitutes establishing an enterprise on government land. What should we do? <laughs> and some smart ass in Missoula gets this thing and sends it back up and says, get two desirable ones. <laughs> and and I, I swear to God, I thought it was too good of a story not to use. I thought the story was apocryphal, but I still wanted to use it, so I put it in the book. And then after the book came out, I was reading in California, and this woman came up to me, and she had this yellowed note in a plastic piece of paper, and it said, get two desirable ones. And she said, that was my grandfather. <laughs> so it had the added value of being true, which a historian loves. You know. <laughs> now, in addition to this culture clash, in addition to the Forest Service hanging by a thread, there was also a little bit of hubris. That's where I talked about nature and your attitude toward nature. And um, Pincho himself had contributed to this. He thought the way to save the Forest Service was to convince these knuckleheads in Congress that it would become the fire service, that they were the only thing standing between you and all these towns burning to the ground. So he wrote a few weeks before the fire the following. In the early days, it was assumed that fires were considered simply and solely acts of God against which any opposition 
was hopeless. It was assumed it was the natural order of things. Today we understand that fires are totally within the control of man. Totally within the control of man. Well, there was a great headline in San Francisco after their um, earthquakes on the eve of the World Series in 1989. In the San Francisco paper, it said, Nature Bats Last. <laughs> and I, that's been one of the themes that's run through my head most of my adult life since then, Nature Bats Last. And that's what happened with the Big Burn. It was very similar, Pinchel's statement, to a thing I found when I was researching the Dust Bowl book, where somebody from the United States Department of Agriculture had put out a statement on the eve of these storms that blew, you know, enough dirt equivalent to how much was dug for the Panama Canal, took it to the sky. Someone wrote on the eve of this, the soil is the one immutable resource that can never be destroyed. I mean, it's like they're asking for it. <laughs> now, um, Roosevelt's successor, President Taft, was not really interested in this creation of Teddy and and uh, Pinchos. Um, in fact, he wasn't interested in being president. He really hated the job. He served one term, and he later went on to become a Supreme Court justice, and in his memoirs, he said the following, I don't remember that I ever was president. So that's the guy in charge of the Forest Service when this thing goes and takes off. Now, I'd mention that they had tried to nitpick this thing to death in the United States Congress to kill it by starvation. One of the leaders of the killers was a guy named Senator Weldon Hayburn, who was against child welfare laws. He thought, you know, 10-year-olds should be down in the mines, a little buggers. And that all of TR's progressive initiatives he despised, but the one he despised the most was public land. He thought that was just an atrocious idea. He had one other senator. I have to mention him, Senator Clark from Montana, who purchased his election as a senator. Back then, they chose senators by the legislature. It only later became with a change in the Constitution that we directly elected them. He sent out envelopes, monogrammed envelopes, with 10 grand inside of the envelopes for each of the votes he purchased. He said, you know, I never bought a man who was not for sale. So that's how he became senator. He also was the third or fourth richest person in America at the time, having made all his money in, in copper mining. Once he got his seat from Montana, he moved to Manhattan, built the biggest house in New York, and never went back to Montana. This while serving as the senator from Montana, of course. Mark Twain said of him, he, Senator Clark was, quote, the most disgusting creature the Republic has yet produced. Now, I mean, for those of us who are struggling with the present day, this is very reassuring to hear uh, <laughs> something like this. You know, that we, we can go into our history, we can do some time traveling, and sometimes it's, um, it's a palliative for a time traveler to go back there. Um, so, the blow up happens. And what happens is these hurricane force winds, they called it a pollucer, come out of the south, out of the Palouse and come, came into the Clearwater Valley. And once it started hitting these peaks, it forced its way up into these chimneys. And that's what got the thing just to take off. And within a few hours, what had been 100 fires was about, had merged into three fires, and then merged into one fire, and it then created its own weather system. They estimated that temperatures were in excess of 2,000 degrees, that the fire was moving faster than any horse at full gallop. Now, one of our heroes, uh, Ed Pulaski, is up there on a ridge just above the town of Wallace, which is the central town in this drama. And he's got a crew with him, and they're sort of, they've been working some of these spot fires when this thing blows up and holy hell happens. Down below, they're trying to get whatever people are left in this town out by taking railroads east to Missoula and west to Spokane. But someone from the Forest Service sends a telegram out at that point. This is just on the Friday night that this thing started, saying all crews, he's talking about the Forest Service crews, all crews hopelessly lost. And that was the last message they sent. They declared martial law. They had some of those African-American soldiers then force off men of wealth and men of means and just men of muscle 
who were putting themselves on those trains because they said only women and children could get on those trains. It was very much like the land version of the Titanic. People were trying to get out. They knew this town was going to blow up. You could see these cinders, I say, the size of a horse's thigh coming down from that ridge in that narrow slot where that town was. This thing was going to go under. Pinky Adair, one of my heroes, the woman I'd mentioned earlier, she is up there in the midst of all this as well. She had this homestead, this little piece of private land that she'd built her log cabin in the middle of the National Forest. And when it looked like they were going to start fighting this big fire, like I said, they'd gathered everyone. They even opened the jails in Missoula, Montana, and let convicts out, uh, including people who were in there for serious felonies, including murder. They go up there and they grab Pinky Adair and they say, they basically drafted her. They said, you're going to cook for all these convicts while they fight this fire. When the thing blows up, they tell Pinky and everyone else to go run and get into this tarn, this two, three foot deep pond off to the way and get a little straw and put the straw up above and breathe and hope that when the thing passes over, they'll live. But what's happening in the middle of this thing, I talked about the wind. These huge trees are coming out, womp, womp, womp. And you, there's a picture in this book of the, the blowdown, this epic blowdown of this national forest. So Pinky's sitting there in this pond. She says, screw this. I'm not going to be crushed like other men were crushed. People were trapped with their legs under these giant timbers that came down. So she gets up out of there, and she walks, and she walks, and she walks for 28 hours. She eventually makes it out of her. Her father recognized it because they used to wear these caulking boots that had little like golf cleat like things. And he heard the sound of the boots on the boardwalk of the little town where she's from. And he knew that Pinky Adair had lived, had made it through. And she lived longer than anyone else, as I said, and told her story in a wonderful oral history in the 1970s, sat for three days and said, by the way, that the big burn was the most exciting thing to happen to her in her life. <laughs> Nothing could come close to it. She'd never felt more alive. Now, they lost this fight. If you want to look at it as a win-lose proposition, I don't think that's the correct way to look at fighting wildfire, but they lost. They got their asses kicked. This thing, those body towns with the horror houses, they're gone. They're wiped off the map. Three million acres, the area the size of the Connecticut that I mentioned, gone, wiped off the map. Enough timber, they figured, in the way that they used to do these things, to rebuild the entire town of Chicago was blown down. A lot of it was white pine, which is a great species that's nearly disappeared from parts of the Intermountain West and is now continuing to disappear with the beetle infestation. So, but what happened was heroes came out of this thing. So the press recalled acts of heroism by individuals, immigrants, the African-Americans who had saved this town, single-handedly didn't run for cover, didn't hide, but saved this town by getting people onto this train and moving them into a tunnel. And only when they got this train into the tunnel could they live. And afterward, I found all these quotes in the local newspaper. I mean, typically patronizing and racist for the day, but still they said, my opinion of the Negro race has gone up considerably since this last episode. Um, so they were heroes. And Roosevelt's forest rangers were no longer thought of as, you know, these, you know, these Yale elites. They were, the, they were the face of America. There was these immigrants, the face of the new America, these immigrants who had fostered this thing. And that is why I call it the fire that saved America. Because there was a huge public reaction that, oh my God, these people had, were heroic on our behalf. And so Congress not only stopped whittling away at the National Forest, they created National Forests in the East. And the National Forests in North Carolina, in Massachusetts, in Pennsylvania, and there are some, they owe their creation to the Big Burn. So they had done the right thing by this heroism. And Roosevelt and Pinchot's legacy was intact. Like I said, 400 million acres, which we have today in National Wildlife Refuges, more than 400 million. I won't even count Alaska. But, and this is kind of how these things often go, the wrong lesson was applied. What Pinchot had said before, that the Forest Service would become the fire service, that's what happened. 
So thereafter, they tried to put out every wildfire. And they developed this lookout system, which we still have remnants of today, lookouts all over the West. And they had this thing called the 10 o'clock rule, which is that if you saw a fire the night before, it had to be put out by 10 o'clock the next day. And one of my writer heroes, Norman MacLean, who wrote a beautiful book, Young Men in Fire, after he wrote an even more beautiful book, one of the most perfect books ever written, A River Runs Through It, where if you want to see just gin clear prose at its essence, open any page of A River Runs Through It and you'll just feel sated. Um, I was lucky enough to just write a new introduction for the new edition of Young Men in Fire. And McLean spent his last years, almost 20 years, right up until he died in his upper 80s, trying to figure out this one wildfire in Montana, not the Big Burn, but the Man Gulch Fire of 1949, and why history had to repeat themselves, why people had to die for this thing. Um, but he remembered, as a young man, being on the Bitterroot River in 1910, and his daddy scooping him up and saying, run, when the Big Burn happened. And he said thereafter, every single person in the Forest Service had Big Burn on the brain. So for the most of the 20th century, what did they do? They altered nature. They tried to put out every wildfire. And of course, you need fire. There are many species of trees that will not reproduce without fire. Uh, lodgepole pine, I think, is one of them. The cones will not open without periodic fire that comes through. So we had all this fuel buildup, and that accounted for some of the catastrophic fires, including Yellowstone in the late part of the 20th century and the early part of this century. Now, I want to close with a um, story about this guy made that tool, Ed Pulaski. Uh, he, as I said, was not a little GP. He was, um, he was on his second marriage. He had uh, probably 20 odd jobs by the time the Forest Service hired him. Um, he didn't have a college education. He didn't have a high school education. He wasn't from that famous Pulaski family. Polish-American family that was so important in the American Revolutionary War, although so many people asked him that after a while, I said, yeah, yeah, those are my people. Um, he is the only, there should be many others, but he is the one person who got out of here with his reputation entirely intact, but died a bitter, bitter man. What happened during the Big Burn was he had this crew up there on the ridge, remember I talked about them. The thing blows up. So he basically commandeers this crew. He says, if you want to live, you follow me. And he takes this crew of people, I think there were 20 odd folks, and they go into this mine shaft. And a lot of people don't want to go in there. They think they'll never come out. It's got a little smoke on the outside, but he said, this is the only way to save us. They go into this mine shaft. There's water at the base, two, three feet of water in places. And they go in there and several people do die. They actually drown, being squished upon, and that water gets in them. But most of them live. Now, Pulaski himself is badly burned. He will lose his vision for most of his rest of his life. His leg had caught fire. His skin is reeling off. And from the trauma of this, he completely passes out. And he's at the gate of this tunnel. And before the fire is out, somebody shouts out, the boss is dead. Let's make a run for it. And they try to push past Pulaski, and he rouses himself, and he takes a pistol out. And he points it at these people and says, you aren't going anywhere. If you're going to live, you're going to stay in this tunnel. They stayed in that tunnel, and most of them, I think it was 21 out of 24, did leave. And someone did a painting. You should go to the um, gallery here that's done the, um, the paintings inspired by that shows the Pulaski crew. It's really interesting. So they, and you can go to this mine shaft. They stumble out of this mine shaft at dawn. And it's just the, the moonscape of a destroyed, what had been a forest is now, you know, just smoke and cinders. And they make their way down this trail back to Wallace, Idaho, most of which is destroyed as well. Many of them had lost their boot soles and they're walking barefoot with, you know, calloused, burned bottoms down these cinders there. Or they put, they've wrapped their shirts or some leather around their feet. They make their way down there. They just look motley and horrible. Um, they're in the hospital, but they're kicked out after three or four days because none of them had health insurance. Gee, <laughs> recurring theme in America, you know. Um, and they pass the hat to try to protect these brave boys, to give them some health insurance, to give them a little money. 
Pulaski never recovers. He spends about the next 15 years of his life um, doing two things. One, trying to honor the memory of those dead. Will you do something? Can we bring those bodies down? He mows the lawn around the grave where some of them are buried outside of Wallace, outside of what is left of Wallace. He petitions Congress to try to have some money for the health care of these people or for some memorial. And he also tries to get a patent on this wonderful tool. As I said, the most used tool, seemingly a simple tool, but actually the, you know, a feat of genius in its creation, and he, he loses his patent. He spends the last 15 years of his life very bitter man at what the, how the government had treated him. He dies. Well, a hundred years after the big burn, I was lucky enough to go to a memorial in Wallace, Idaho, and there were Buffalo soldiers from the modern day regiment of Buffalo soldiers. There were grandchildren of people who'd lived through the big burn. There were people from uh, the different families who'd lived through. And finally, we had done right by Ed Pulaski. We were unveiling, um, they were unveiling a memorial. And you can do it today if you go to Wallace, Idaho. You could walk what are essentially the stations of the cross up this hill to where the mine shaft was. And then you can walk down, you can look at the shaft, walk down and, and see the valley. Now largely recovered, of course. And you can see, you know, some of the things, the chars, uh, cinders that are left from this thing. Um, but he got finally his due. So we are, we are tardy to recognize some of our heroes. We finally came around to him. We are tardy to our lessons, but we finally learned this as well, that, that nature does bat last. Today we do let some wildfires go, but we're also entering an age of powerful and awful wildfires that are in part the cause of human hubris, that are in part the cause of human excess, that are in part the cause of the fact that we refuse to not destroy this place. So we have learned some lessons, and that's why I time travel, is that we will bring these lessons back and never forget them. Thank you, folks. And And I, I do have some time to take some questions. There are microphones in the um, aisles that are being set up right now. So I'm looking for uh, some very curious Bellinghamites, if that's the way you call it. So let's go with the first question over here. Thank you for writing your books. Your books are wonderful to read. They're a lot of fun. Well, thank um, you. I'm curious, though. When you talk about un unintended consequences, it, it strikes me that one of the unintended consequences of setting up the Forest Service is that, and setting up the National Forest is that essentially we have given, the U through, via the U.S. government, we have betrayed the idea that these are the people's lands, the people's forests, when they're actually just nothing but a, a naked giveaway to the, to the timber companies who buy up the trees for pennies on a dollar, um, destroy the land by plowing roads through pristine wilderness and take all that timber and for their own profit and nothing goes back to the U.S. public. So I was wondering if you could maybe speak on that for a bit. So you've teed one up for me there and thank you. Um, <laughs> I didn't mention this, but it's in the last chapter of my book and um, again, you have all year to read it, but uh, Pinchot lived for a long time. He later became governor of uh, Pennsylvania. He thought he would be president. He became friends with the other Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, the Democrat. He lived to see almost half of America. He was born, I think, in um, 1865, and he died in 1946 or something. I mean, he just had a remarkably long life. But in his later years, he went back to see his creation. He went back to see in the 1920s and the 1930s what had become of these national forests that he had roamed around. I mean, he and T.R. had literally put these maps out on the floor of the White House. And Roosevelt, there's a quote from him where he goes, oh God, the Flathead Valley, have you ever been up there? It's extraordinary, we have to include that. So they're just drawing these maps and putting this up. So Pitcher went back and he was disgusted. They were starting to clear cut. The industrial clear cuts had not taken over yet. But not only had the Forest Service become the fire service, 
but the Forest Service, which was supposed to be the custodian of the people's land. And they made this very clear. TR and Pincho said, the rich person can always get what they want. Damn it, this is belongs, they use this word, to the little guy. I mean, someone that size, I guess. Uh, they always talked about this little guy deserves it. So he was disgusted that, at the, that they, this thing had been transferred to the timber companies. We were giving them away at just a fire sale price. He was appalled at that. And that continued through most of the 20th century. Now, the thing that bothers me right now, I'm gonna, sorry, allow me a, I am an opinion columnist now, so I'm going to give you a one minute rant. Uh, <laughs> We have these millions of acres, most of them are on BLM land, Bureau of Land Management, in gorgeous parts of the West that we're now just using as pin cushions for oil and gas. And you know what, this thought struck me the other day, I was watching 60 Minutes about these um, people who were suing the United States government on behalf of our children, uh, who won't, who are, the planet is being destroyed and the children are saying, you can't do this to us. And the lawsuit is actually advanced. And this, this occurred to me that these public lands which were set up for these children, are now being used to kill them, are now being used to further their end because we've turned them into, like I said, pin cushions for oil and gas. So I don't take issue with what you said. Public lands are the arguably one of the most dramatic representations of how elections have consequences. They are entirely different depending on who's in charge. One era, they're going to be they're going to be just pure commodity driven, strip them of the trees, get as much oil and gas, dam all the rivers. Another administration is going to look at them and see the future. That is where anyone, I always get really pissed off when people say, oh, they're all the same, elections don't have consequences. I mean, they have consequences on public land and so many other areas. But I'm sorry, I, I can't disagree with you. I wish I could give you a, a more optimistic assessment. We're still using public lands like that. We just, under the Trump administration, had the largest environmental rollback in history, which was we actually took something in the National Park Service down in southern Utah, and they cut it in more than half. So, yes. Yes. Um, as I was reading your book, I was wondering about the indigenous people, and I wonder if in your research you found anything about how they responded to all of this. Well, you know, they, and I found this in the Dust Bowl. I was really fascinated by this. Native people got written out of so many of the stories, be, and it's too, it's too bad for a million reasons, but one of the worst parts of it is there was no record. There was no, you couldn't turn to someone and say, wow, has this ever happened before, and how did you deal with it? When the Dust Bowl happened, it happened in the 1930s. They had moved all the natives off of the Southern Plains. They couldn't, they were living in these postage stamp sized reservations in Oklahoma, so they couldn't go to the Kiowa and the Apache and the Lords of the Plains and say, you know, what was this like 100 years ago? They destroyed the institutional record because it was an oral record. A similar thing happened with fire. Natives used fires in different ways. They would start them some years and let areas burn. They seemed to know that certain areas had to have fire. They seemed to know that certain areas were prone to burn. But the, the institutional memory was gone. So they really couldn't do much with it. They really couldn't rely much on that. Um, I, I looked long and hard, because I'm, I'm really interested in this. I wrote a book on, last time I was here in uh, Bellingham four years ago, I talked about Edward Curtis, the man who tried to make native people live forever. And that's the way he's put it. And so I really tried to find a native voice in the big burn, and I couldn't find one. It was as if they never existed. Yeah, and partially, that's why they screwed up so much. Again, they, they destroyed the institutional memory. Um, was Pinky Adair related to Red Adair, who is the famous aerial firefighter? Um, it's a long way to say no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Pinky wrote this, had this wonderful memoir. Like I said, somebody from the University of Idaho went to her nursing home in the 1970s and sat with her three days and got this great tale, but she didn't have any children. And she's not related to Adair. But <clears throat> that gives me a chance to say one more thing. <laughs> and I learned this in the Dust Bowl. All these people may be living in a nursing home. Maybe they're your grandparents. Maybe they're your parents. Get their stories. People have fabulous stories. And they're dis I mean, we're losing the last of the World War II generation right now. 
And if you haven't got your family story, sit with the people right now. I mean, that's, that was the power of Pinky Adair's. Someone, someone just went and ran a tape recorder for three days. And me as a storyteller, if I didn't have that wonderful texture, that wonderful detail, I wouldn't have been able to write half this book. Yes? Uh, I find myself uh, sharing your curiosity about your characters. So um, that relates really well. I'm wondering how do you communicate that? Or, or what's interesting about that, you know, in the research? Is it a spark in their eye? You know, what catches your attention about, about those people? So, yeah, <clears throat> thank you for that question. I, I do all my own research. Now, a lot of people who write kind of narrative nonfiction hire other people to do it, and I think that's crazy. Um, this is where you find the magic. This is where you find the details. Now, I, I'll never forget the Dust Bowl stuff. So I, this woman, probably 93 years old, in this godforsaken town in the panhandle of Oklahoma, and I'm sorry, I know that's a redundancy, but, um, <laughs> you know, I close my notebook, and she says, no, no, just wait on, wait a minute, young man. I'm like, thank you for calling me young man. And uh, she goes back, and she gets a shoebox. She rustles around. She comes back, and she sets the shoebox down. She opens the top of the shoebox. Magic pours out. Letters, pictures, diary notations, stories of a life. And that's why I do my own research, because you can find those things, those wonderful details. So I'm always, when I'm doing research, I'm looking for a storytelling arc. Because I approach history as a storyteller. Now, there's academic historians who say that's the wrong approach. You know, you're putting it into a human construct. Well, I'm sorry, I can't put it into a monkey construct, you know. <laughs> that we are storytelling people. people. We're narrative people. You know, we're, we have family narratives. We have, crea Indians all have creation narratives, how they came here. And a lot of them are, have the same story. So I'm looking for detail. I'm looking for storytelling arc. And I'm, and I'm also looking for, like I just said, the, the little texture. What was the wind like on a certain day? Um, how did you feel when you saw your daughter walk off and knowing you may never see her again? All those little things that help make a story come to life novelistically. So I build the structure, here's history, this fire, um, and I, I love the policy stuff that's going on, but I try to find this human detail in the middle of it, and that's, what I, that's where you get out of your research. Thanks, yes. Thank you for the bringing this very important public policy you know, to, to the people. Um, in your books, your dedication has have normally been to work towards your family. In this book, I don't know who you dedicated the book to. And at your introduction, you talked about you're a journalist and not a historian. I think you're both because you make it so living for us. But uh, how does the dedication of this book fit into that picture? I think I dedicated it to my best friend, Sam Verhovic. I'm pretty sure that these books, yeah. So here's who I dedicated it to. To Sam Halverhovic, friend, editor, writer, and adopted son of the Pacific Northwest, no bow tied bum kisser, he. Now, <laughs> now that's an inside joke because Sam is from Boston and um, his family all went to Harvard and they called them all bow tied bum kissers. And Sam says, God, the last thing I do in life, I'm, never, I'm gonna move out west, I'm never gonna become a bow tied bum kisser. It's kind of an obscure phrase, a nice alliteration. Um, and Sam was a New York Times correspondent uh, colleague of mine. Uh, our families are very close. He officiated at my daughter's wedding recently. We were just on the stage two nights ago in Seattle where we, had, we hosted Dean Baquet, executive editor of the New York Times at uh, Seattle Arts and Lectures. So um, Sam's a very good editor. I think, just if you can allow me 10 seconds on writing here, uh, Every writer, and I know there's a lot of writers in here because Bellingham does breed arts and does breed introspection and does breed creativity. That's always something I've noticed about this city and what I like about it. And why you get so many people turn out on a reading on a Tuesday night, you know, to the, your independent bookstore. Um, you need someone to tell you your stuff is crap. You need someone to be honest with you. You need someone to say, this doesn't work. 
you need someone to realize that. Um, I always, I, I, I'm just finishing a book now, and I, I went out to eight readers, and I said, if you're really my friend, you won't be afraid to tell me the parts that are really bad, the parts where it d doesn't work. So Sam's one of those for me. He's one of my regular readers um, who really helps me see things. I mean, because you get lost in creation. That's what, I mean, no matter what you're doing, if you're just cooking even, you suddenly just get lost in the act of creation. It's a joyous, wonderful thing. I, I think creation is one of the great mysteries of life. The ingredients are there, but you don't know what's going to follow. So I put all my factual pieces. I'm writing narrative nonfiction, so they're factual pieces. I can't make it up like a novelist can. You know, <laughs> I, I put these pieces in place, and then I hope that, boom, I hope that the magic takes place. And if it doesn't, people like Sam are there to tell me. Yes? I have uh, read many of your books. I think uh, The Immortal Irishman is one of, of the best. This was... Uh, 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 the main character was born in the 19th century, and I'm wondering how you go about your research and finding out that fascinating story. I'm so glad you asked me about that because, um, so I'm Irish American, but I, I was somewhat of a lapsed Irish American. Um, I didn't go in for a lot of uh, patty whackery, as they call it, you know. I mean, I, I, I knew my family history. I knew my father's side. We came here because we were famine Irish, which was a horrible thing I didn't realize later, largely caused by the Brits. A million Irish died in four years, and another million was forced to flee the country. Basically, one in four people. The Brits later recognized it as a semi-act of, of genocide, if not an outright act of genocide. So here's how the way this happened, honest to God. Um, I was in Montana, I don't know, 10, 12 years ago, when I was the Western correspondent. I'm interviewing the um, Democratic governor of the state of Montana, Brian Schweitzer. And outside of the state capital of Montana is this giant equestrian statue of this, well, equestrian a guy on a horse. And at the base of the statue are these firing words against the British Empire. Like, we will no longer be your slave. We will no longer let you keep us down. We will live free no matter what you do. The boot of England will be off our neck. And I'm like reading this thing. I go, wow, who's this effing guy on a horse? <laughs> and uh, it's the most prominent statue in all the state of Montana. You could see it, you know, miles around. It sits at a prominent. And the governor looks at me and he says, what's your full name? I said, Timothy Patrick Egan. He said, you call yourself an Irishman? <laughs> and you've never heard of Thomas Francis Marr? I said, no, I've never heard of him. Well, he was the most famous Irish American until John F. Kennedy came along. He lived 12 lives in 46 years. He survived the famine. He survived the, the revolution of 1848 when he, he was supposed to be hanged, drawn, and quartered, and his remains disposed of as Her Majesty shall see fit. What was his crime for that sentence? Advocating for Irish independence, advocating for the right of people to govern themselves. He shipped off to Tasmania, where one in four of the convicts are from Ireland. They're just taking kids off the street, orphans, and sending them to the slave continent of Australia. And a special place in Australia, in Tasmania, is for the Irish political prisoners. That's where Thomas Marr, he escapes from Tasmania. He comes to New York City and becomes the most famous Irish American of his day in the 1850s. And when the Civil War breaks out, unlike other Irish in the South, he decides not to side with the slaveholders, but to side with Abraham Lincoln, because that's the country that took him in. He founds the Irish Brigade, which is in all the major battles of the Civil War. They had the second highest casualty rate of any other units. And then he ends up as the territorial governor of Montana. If I couldn't do anything with that material, <laughs> you know, I'm just not a writer. So um, that's my way of saying, read the book. <laughs> no. So what was really cool about that was I, I just learned about my heritage. And I, you know, I spent time in Australia, and I went to the jail cell where he was awaiting to be hanged, drawn, and quartered. I saw these horrible ghost villages where all the, the victims of the famine were buried. I saw pictures, drawings of little children whose teeth were stained green because they were gnawing on grass. 
I went to all the Civil War battlefields, which I'd never done before, and realized what an industrial slaughter it was, more casualties than any other war in our history. And then spent time watch, walking the um, rugged, you know, hills around Virginia City where he was governor and um, where he was ultimately assassinated in my theory. So anyway, that was, that was wonderful and you dream of that. I'm going to take one more question. Um, I was hoping you could talk about your writing process and how you decide what stories and what little tidbits get put in each book. He asked me about the writing process. So I'm looking at a couple stories right now for a, a new book and I want drama. I want there to be a clash. I like big issues. I like wonderful characters. Now, that said, I pity the historians who come back to 2019 and try to find letters, diaries, <laughs> Texas, dude, what you up to? You know, I mean, it's, it's going to be horrible. We don't have, we don't, we're not letter writers anymore. We don't keep diaries anymore. Well, some people do, but most of us don't. Um, our interior life is ephemeral. That's what's so great about being a time traveler. God, these Victorians can't shut that up. I mean, <laughs> Thomas Mars' letters were, I read this letter to the love of his life, this love letter. He said, he said I'm a fugitive. This is when he's in, the British Empire has a price on my head. I will never see Ireland. I will never see my family, but I love you more than any man can ever love a woman. I will make you half of me. I will share everything. I cried when I read this letter. I go, geez, these Victorians could write. Now, there's a little flourishy, fruffery stuff that we kind of rebel at, but you know, that's why Pride and Prejudice is so, that's why we love, you know, we're still watching Victoria now on Masterpiece, or, because, so, you know, I, I look for stuff where I can get into the minds of the characters, and you can only do that if you have their letters and diaries. People say, how do you know what Thomas Francis Marr, he died in um, 1860, 1867. How can you know what he was thinking? And my answer is, I have his letter, his diary entry from that day where he said, gloomful day for me, I've never felt more melancholy because the love of my life is not here. So I can describe it. Or he can describe being hung over. So I look for stuff where I can get inside the characters' heads. That's why Pinky Adair was so wonderful. That's why Teddy Roosevelt, our most prolific president, who never had a thought, he didn't commit to paper. Um, <laughs> which is why the Library of Congress, like it's like 20,000 square feet of just Roosevelt stuff alone. Um, Gifford Pinchot and his ghost. I mean, it was deciphered later by a scholar, but what a wonderful story. Um, the, the Buffalo soldiers have kept a really good history of these African Americans and what things they did. So I look for those details to bring it to life. And I look and hope that in a few years I can come back to Bellingham. Thank you. Thank you.